virgins. And do not be afraid, for you have found favor with WebDM, and we are here to inform you of the immaculate conception of your very own Asimov. <laughs> you said ass. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Craft Mastery and their book, Ethnographic References for Fantasy Campaigns. This supplement creates detailed worlds from the ground up with animated environments and references, 3D maps, and in-depth lore on philosophy, culture, and politics with charts and explanations that can all be used in any fantasy campaign. We've never seen a supplement like this, folks, and they are adding new content every week. So be sure to check it out, link here, and in the description. All right, Jim. Yeah. Let's have a bit of a touch of the divine. Oh. Just a touch. Just a touch. We're going to it's get... Completely consensual. Mm, okay. Well, generally that kind of thing wasn't though, was it, with Zeus and all that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about how Asimar are made. We're just here to talk about how Asimar are made. Okay? <laughs> yes. That's what I'm trying to get to. Tieflings have this sort of fertile, uh, you know, ground with the in infernal and, and the touch of darkness to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they're sort of popular. Asimar are, you know, they're kind of like good aligned counterparts. When I look at them, I really, I really like Asimar. I find that I want to elevate them to the same place in my campaign worlds as tieflings. And in some, several of my homebrew I, I have, but I find that they just don't seem to get as much of the love that tieflings get. Right. Well, and everybody loves a bad boy. Ever right? for one. Right. God. So that's why you play a fallen <laughs> Asimov. Uh, sure, that's why you play a fallen one. But I also think it's it has something to do with the fact that when I first sort of discovered Asimov through Planescape, they were just presented as these are the plain touched peoples from the upper planes. And that encompasses a wide range of different celestials that they might have, you know, as ancestors or come into contact with. Mm -hmm. And of course there are different different sort of types. There was not just Asimar, there were different other sort of like plane touched from the upper planes whose names now escape me as I think about it off the top of my head. It's the same way that tieflings sort of represent, there were infernal tieflings and sort of abyssal and, and those tieflings who came from the places in between and the border regions where it's not quite upper plane and not quite lower, they're more about law and chaos. I liked all of that complexity, but the way it seems to be presented in fifth edition is sort of like one facet of that. These are the people who have been touched in some way by the holiness of the light of Mount Celestia. Yeah. That's the plane of lawful goodness. It's the plane where capital A angels uh, reside, not necessarily the guardianals or the, the Eldrin who are not fey creatures, but the celestials. <laughs> the other, the <laughs> the other, other Eldrin. kind of Eldrin. I, I think that maybe that might be part of it in that uh, with this sort of narrow focus of them, them being from Mount Celestia, I guess that mirrors the focus of tieflings being like the infernal variety. But uh, yeah, I, I like the I like to think about them in a lot of different ways, and more than just like I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, hidebound traditionalist who's here to, you know, break up all your fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that isn't holy. That isn't right. right. It wasn't written that way in the scrolls. It passed sure. down long ago. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's talk about some ways to think about these holier than thou's. Sure. I mean, do they have to always be holier than thou? Can't they uh, maybe have a run of bad luck, uh, excommunicated from the church? It brings up the mind of like, what is the actual relationship uh, between the cultures and peoples mm -hmm. in, in your world and whatever divinities you've created for it? I mean, even across the, the standard uh, sort of campaign settings in Dungeons and Dragons, we have a wide variety of interactions between the gods and their worshipers, uh, if they're even common knowledge that gods actually exist or not, or whether it's a genuine article of faith. It's worth thinking about those things because Asimar fits somewhere in there and figuring out sort of like how the whole thing sort of fits together and then where would be the place of children born with this you know, manifestation. Is it in fact something where an ancestor of theirs was in the presence of a powerful celestial or angel and mm -hmm. that just sort of affected them or changed them or or maybe they visited Mount Celestia or whatever uh, counts for heaven in your world and it changed them and thereafter they sort of begin this uh, celestial bloodline almost. I like thinking about it like that because mm -hmm. if it's possible to walk to or travel to or these different places in the outer planes and have them change you and have them have an impact on your progeny and whoever comes after you then that suggests to me that there would be cultures who were built around that 
sort of thing. Like, like maybe protecting a bloodline, protecting like almost, a bloodline, like right. a, a divine bloodline as oh, opposed sure. to a royal bloodline. Absolutely right. Like when you think about all the silliness and tragedy and just ridiculous things that have happened because of the concept of bloodline in our own world, and then you attach to that real magical significance. The people of this bloodline can make things glow and heal with a touch. I yeah. mean, there would be some, some significance attached to that, uh, and then you'd have the people coming after it, trying to take it away. You, mm -hmm. gotta, you gotta steal that blood. That's just right for DMs to, to, to pick apart for, for campaigns or adventures or whatever. I like that because it suggests that there's a, a, a larger world at play and that the connections between these places are, are are different. Perhaps part of protecting that bloodline is making sure that enough people make that journey there to make sure the strength of that impact remains. And so maybe it's sort of like something that happens every generation or every hundred years or once a year or whatever it is that they make this pilgrimage and then surely that culture would build some sort of like significance into it and, yeah. and try to solidify their or, or justify it. In my worlds, I've got one, the the, uh, the Empress of the or, uh, the Empire of War called Palantine is uh, the culmination of these two uh, factions within the Imperial family that seek a uh, magical advantage where they can. And so some of those factions, uh, you know, have a philosophy or outlook of, of traveling to the upper planes, of dealing with celestials and the like, and Asimar are common amongst that side of the family. Mm -hmm. Then the other would be tieflings, and so it's these really represents two two halves of the of the imperial family yeah. that are constantly vying for one another and then whichever uh, offspring seems to have both traits is the is the ruler and so that happens enough often that it's worth the conflict and tension but for the siblings who only have one sort of trait or the other it's really bad news because there's all sorts of intrigue and backbiting and, and they're all powerful casters because it's a majocracy. It's all about one family's pursuit of magical power across generations and how they turned that into political power. Sounds very Benny Gesserit. <laughs> yeah. Looking it, for the Kwisatz Haderach. Mm. I mean, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Another way to think about it is, what would it be like to be the descendant of some kind of celestial being in a world where maybe it was very low magic? Like, it's a character concept I did in, in yeah. one of the seasons of Saber Dice, mm. Elva Dean. Like, yeah. this very low magic world, and you have this guy who can walk around and just heal. Right. And it all comes from within. And, and, it, and you're clearly touched by something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's obvious, and he gets run out of places even after he helps them because yeah. it's so, oh, you yeah, know. Yeah, so and terrifying. It, an Asimar Divine Soul Sorcerer is not a bad character combination. No, first off, like it, mechanically it fits perfectly, <laughs> but thematically it's it's like you're taking that idea of, of a divine lineage and like really mm. amping it up by combining the Asmar with, with that sorcerer subclass. I, I think of, uh, of all kinds of different combinations, especially when you're talking about like worlds that aren't quite so high magic, yeah. <laughs> where common knowledge of the planes and their impact is, you know, is readily available. But, and what if it's like a, a secret order within a temple or a church or something that finds these children with these certain birth signifiers, right? Mm -hmm. That, that you know, it was long, long ago, a group of angels trod the earth, and, and you can still detect their influence and in finding those people and raising them in these secluded monasteries and fortresses and the like, so that if there's someone out there when the world needs them. When they come of age, they become just sort of like wandering uh, swordsmen, you know, knights errant, heroes and the like. So. Maybe it's something like that. If your world's sort of grim, dark, and, and tends towards the gritty, that could be like a ray of hope or, or a certain concept that a character could play with. Or bring some light to the dark, you know. I, that's the that's what I like. I like playing an Asimar in a place where everyone else is just wretched, and you have a chance to be a, a genuinely decent person. Yeah, and really lean into that archetype. Yep. What about non-angelic Asimar? Like the atheist Asimar? Oh, Either yeah. that or like, yeah, I, God, I spent <laughs> my entire childhood in heaven. What a dump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just another place. You realize you can go there, right? It could reveal, if you did, went that way, how like the prime material world attaches significance to the places in the outer planes and mm -hmm. how like this is just like a place that exists as state of being part like mystical plane you guys are the ones who invested it with all this morality. You know, yeah. <laughs> you all, y'all are the ones who, you know, who created into something more. They're just like, these angels just maintains a you know, type of cosmic balance and see, don't really see themselves as the subjects of this religion. That could be a way to portray that, right? Yeah. Like you could really play with those. You know, those <laughs> angels, they, they don't really care. 
you get there and they're like, oh, more soldiers, good. Yeah, you right, know, yeah. To, they, for the fight of good. Yeah, what do they care about a one mortal life, you know? I'm thinking also along the lines of places that aren't Mount Celestia. You know, there's a whole bunch of upper planes, planes of, say, neutral and chaotic good, uh, for one. Are the Asimar or what, let's maybe call them more like celestial touched? Could we use the Asimar uh, as they exist or, or would we need to tweak things? And I think you could get by with just reskinning most mm-hmm. of the stuff or, or even just saying like, yeah, my, my Asimar might have like, they don't like look like a standard Asimar or they don't come from some sort of, you know, lawful good angelic being or anything. I think that like, like tieflings, Asimars can look like anything. They don't have oh, to, sure, right. they don't have to be the, the glowing radiant yeah, perfect silver so. gold hair. Go wild, go nuts. You know, go yeah. nuts, you know, yeah. get blue skin and, and purple hair. Who All cares? All kinds of things. As a magical humanoid, yeah. Asimar works well. I, I find that I use them a lot in concepts where it's like, they're not human. This person, this thing, this whatever is not human. Mm-hmm. But they're human-esque. I don't want something like an elf or, or something like that. I, I want someone who reads as human but who's been touched by something. In that sense, I see Asimar as almost like, say, demigods of, of, of Greek myth, right? Like they're just touched by the gods, by mm-hmm. divinity, whatever you want to call it, and you know, are capable of these heroic and fantastical uh, things. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's why they play well with sorcerers, also with warlocks. And sure. Asimar seeking out ones, the yeah. patron, uh, the mm-hmm. ancestor that gave birth to their line. Yeah. yeah, I like that one. I like the fallen Asimar, uh, you know, fiend warlock. Who's, oh, yeah. who's gone to the to the other gone side. Rogue. Yeah, oh. gone rogue. Of course, any of the charisma-based classes they're going to play well with. You can throw in Paladin to any of those and sort of like play with the different... Protector Asimar Paladin, it's right there. Yeah. I mean... The one that I really, really want to play is a fallen Asimar Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. The idea being there that they deal, they, they sort of like can trap the souls of the people they kill. I played this concept in a one shot once and I think they were human and having played them as human, I was like, I, I don't know, I want that extra step of them being, you know, there's something more supernatural about them. Yeah. I think having that fallen Asimar and reskinning Ancestral Guardian to be like, well, I killed you, you're mine now and you will serve me and you will protect those that I tell you to protect. Maybe uh, the aspect that created your lineage was like the ferryman of the dead or something. Mm-hmm. And so you just have that touch of the soul. You can like, yeah. no, 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 I can redirect the soul and keep it. I can keep it, yeah. You, know, I keep, you, didn't, yeah. you didn't pay me my two pennies. Come on, know. man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think that, you know, it doesn't read Tiefling to me. It, tiefling has a demonic, monstrous feel to it. And this is more a person who's mastered a very particular and dark type of magic that's best represented by this combo. Any kind of caster or warrior can benefit from this tinge of the divine. You want to get into some of the the options there? Get down to nitty gritty? Yeah, get down to nitty gritty because any kind of fighter type because... I mean, Asmar, they get that lay on hands ability. Any kind of like self healing yeah. is going to be great. And with two of the subclasses having strength, con is one mm. of the bonuses. You're good for a caster, a charisma caster, because more con, hey, that's well, thinking, good. Thinking of something like Scourge Asmar for just a fighter, right? Oh, like yeah. it gives the fighter who normally has trouble with multiples, like AoE, things like that. While they have second wind, having that extra from lay on hands, it, it just sort of like shores up some things that fighter doesn't normally mm-hmm. have. And even though, like, eh, Man, you're not going to do anything with that plus two charisma, but surely you can think of things to do as a charismatic fighter, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe if you even want to lean into that. Yeah, and being a leader of men. Sure, women, yeah, exactly. You know? Right, well, you're a captain of some mercenary company. Whatever reason, people just seem to like you and be drawn to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't have to be this overt thing where you're like a paladin or, or a big charisma caster. Maybe you're just like, eh, 12 bumps up to a 14. Like, I don't know, maybe it's different this time around. Normally, I play all physical stats with my fighters. My branch out. Throw uh, some intimidates in there. Sure, Maybe yeah. Maybe a persuasion. Who knows? Oh, Go wild. Geez. Scourge <laughs> does work well with that because like you're saying, dealing with AoEs, having the 10 foot uh, initial burst, extra damage on, on one hit after that. Yeah. I mean, any bonus to damage. A bonus damage, and, and like there's specific situations where that might be really useful, but I think otherwise it's just a nice sort of visual, it's a nice damage sort of boost. It fits well and it shores up that little bit that the fighters don't normally get. I like protectors for clerics, right? They're just a solid choice for cleric. You get a little bit more of what you would normally have mm-hmm. and really lean into the archetype. What I'm thinking of now is that the, the <laughs> Asimar cleric that sticks out the most in my mind was actually an Asimar death cleric. Josh is Gustav from mm-hmm. our evil game who took everything about being a holy warrior, holy person and twisted it, made it dark and monstrous and, and evil uh, in a really wicked way. And the fact that he was this 
for a while at least, this beautiful celestial being who, you know, was so full of evil was, I, I like that juxtaposition of it. Yeah, yeah. And then the See, vanity of when he became a lich and trying to keep his flesh intact. <laughs> no, you're going to lose that. You're lose that face that. is eventually going to yeah. sluice off. <laughs> Let me tell you something, because I'm pretty sure I was a scourge because I had that, that radiant, uh -huh, uh, yeah. I wanted that radiant energy to throw up and then throw up spirit guardians. Dude, it was just, I mean, you just talk about just chewing through people. Yeah, I was it was it was a little ridiculous yeah. uh, after a while. But it works, it works yeah. with a life, I mean, especially with a life cleric, because I mean, you just, having healing just falling out of your armor. It's really ridiculous. great, it, it, I mean, it makes you even more survivable, right? If you save, say, your lay on hands for yourself and now your spells are freed up for others or, you you just I don't know you <laughs> spread that little bit of healing around and and then conserve your spells. I like the doubling up on it, and I think it works well for both the class and the concept. Any others that stand out? I'm, I'm trying to think of like non sort of like non standard like what, what would you do with like an say an Asimar wizard or something like that? Something that doesn't have the stat synergy but is still potentially interesting. Yeah, I mean here's the thing: wizards usually a lot of times you think wizard oh bookish. Mm -hmm. You, you stay in your you stay in your lab. You stay in your library. Mm -hmm. You don't ever come out. No, no, no. This guy's coming out. He's wheeling and dealing. Yeah. He's selling his spells. He's going around. He's seeing the kids. Maybe he's a diviner. People don't really know he's a diviner, but he's already paid off all the kids in the town because he's got an eye on every corner. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And what does he do? He goes over. He uses his hand, lay on hands to heal the kids whenever they get hurt. Oh, things yeah. like that. You use your extra abilities and your charisma. To, to garner all the extras, all the non like combat, like oh casting spells, whatever. No, no, no. Fill out that character with with who they really are in the community. Right, right. So you, that I think that concept you can go like a couple of ways with it. You could go the darker route and like gather yeah, a charlatan, mm -hmm. maybe they're an enchanter, like you're saying diviner, and, and yeah. using that to their advantage. But they use the fact that Asimar seemed to have a great reputation to you know as part of that con mm -hmm. uh, to get what they want or to manipulate yeah. things. What if the the problem with them wasn't that they're like sinister or, or out to do something bad, but they're just a freeloader? Yeah. <laughs> they don't <laughs> like, do anything. Just I, again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like everybody likes them. They got some mm -hmm. magic. I, I got that I said I think that speaks more towards like a sorcerer. I like the idea of them being like also a bookish wizard, playing on other people's assumptions about uh, Asimar. I'm thinking of another another sort of one where instead of it being like I'm I'm a I'm tricky or whatever. It's it leans into the the goodness of the Asimar and then being like wardens and, and divine protectors and maybe going like abjurer or something like that. And you are a like a demon hunter or or, or an exorcist or something. And it's your job to like go around and well, all right, well, this demon got loose. Like here I am, or, or it's a rogue mage. You know, somebody's causing trouble. Like all right, mm -hmm. I got my I'm I'm good. We're here. We're all good. Yeah. And that sort of like sense of peace and and calm and serenity. And then they just you know unleash their magical powers on their enemies. Okay. Oh, definitely. And having the uh, the ability to fly is nothing to scoff at. No, uh, especially no. if you if you go radiant soul. Sure. It's a, yet another one of those those races. And, well, for one, in this case, it's like one minute of flight. It's one know, minute of flight a day. Yeah. It sort of brings up the same kind of issues with it. We, we discussed that in our uh, our show on bird people. But in a nutshell, it's like if you find yourself uh, in a situation where a, a PC that can fly is like either ruining environmental challenges or the like, our, my suggestion in that video was to you know expand your thinking on what kind of environments uh, you mm -hmm. present to the players and not always allow a flight to say overcome it and to embrace the fact that they can fly. But this is a combat ability, right? Like it's yeah. extra damage. You might want to use it for just like to get across a chasm or something, but more than likely they're going to be flying around in combat, so varying up your enemies, you know, ready to actions to shoot a flyer, making use of cover yourself if they're trying to pick you off from range and then waiting for them to get closer to you to attack them. All of those are ways that you can deal with a flying PC. And it's also like one minute. Like it's that's like one fight. It's a mechanical option opens up some concepts that normally concentration doesn't allow. Yeah. And if you don't necessarily want to be a bird person and fly around, you don't want to be a tiefling with wings or something like that, or your DMs like you can't have those because they're permanent flight, but one minute is fine. Then it opens up some some options. Like now you can fly and be invisible. Or you can fly and have your concentration protection spells on. Mm -hmm. And you, you might want that because you remember playing old school wizards who had stacked spells and, and flight was just 
a benchmarker of your power. That, yeah. Like, yeah, now I always fly. Now I always fly invisible with stone skin on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, you know, and so on and so on. And then like, you know, eight spells later, you're having difficulties tracking how many of them are active right now. Yeah. God help you if they cast a dispel. Dispel. Oh, it's all gone. <laughs> So, that was the, oh, anyway. Good old days. Asimar rangers and rogues and things like that, that really non-standard stuff, they're, I think they're viable options and you can have a lot of fun with them. Whether it's say, I'm a demigod who is slumming it for a while mm -hmm. and just out to have some fun, or they're a touched by an angel sword connected to the church or the temple, really super religious. Mm -hmm. it, or cast off and forgotten. It, right, or cast off and forgotten. The big one to me, right, is like, they are mortals burdened with the task of angels. And I really like that idea of, of them having a, a much stronger connection to these supernatural beings in a place that's not meant for mortals. The people here and the beings here, they, they don't have the same approach to say choice and will. And, and that surely must put a lot of pressure on an individual Asimar. And that's really good fodder for a character concept and mm -hmm. an idea. And, also, a, a way to highlight the complexities of your world if, say, you've got a bunch of Asmar who are connected to a church, then maybe there's a, a group of them out there somewhere who are like, yeah, this was not for us. <laughs> and you can add some depth to the things that you create for your world. Let's chat for, for DMs out there. Because Asmar, they're supposed to have like a guide, right? So if you're using like the Volos Asimar and, and really leaning into the baseline D&D, lore for them. Yeah, they have this sort of deva who's a mid-ranking celestial that communicates with them in sort of visions, prophecies, and dreams. And it's one of those things where you read the character sort of description in, in, in the entry, it suggests that they're not always accurate <laughs> and that mm -hmm. the deva itself is not omniscient, it's not all powerful. So then you're like, all right, so it's got a guide that's imperfect and is going to mess up. And then it's like, how do you navigate that sending them visions and prophecies that may or may not be true. This is uh, honestly the part, one of the parts of DMing that's always stumped me and that I'm constantly trying to find ways to get around and to portray in a satisfying way is that... You gotta keep it vague first off. For, yeah, <laughs> issuing a satisfying prophecy. What you just described though as, as what they are, yeah. is that not just Metatron and, the, and Dogma? With the main character, oh sure, who's right, the right. Descendant. Yeah. <laughs> she's she's basically an Asimar having right. an angel. What if the fact that it doesn't know is part of the the shtick, right? What if the fact that this deva is is imperfect? Part of the challenge of you having this power that that comes from connection with this place is having access to this information and having to to develop the wisdom to know what in the world they're saying. And they're celestials, right? They're not liars. Unless you're, you're reskinning this and the deva is more like a trickster spirit trying to trip the Asimar up and make them fail. And this now I'm just going like, why don't they have a devil? Why did they just get an angel? Why don't they have literally have an, an angel? Devil, angel and devil on their shoulder. Yeah, right. But yeah. I'm just think, thinking for DMs to like, how do I play this up? Might want to check that out. So for like slain my fallen uh, ancestral guardian necromantic warrior, his would be like a ghost, maybe the first person he ever killed. <laughs> and it's his mom. <laughs> or his mom. Yes, it's something messed up, right? This is not a nice character that I'm thinking about. More fitting for like Warhammer or Shadow of the Demon Lord or something. Something messed up like that. So you yeah. can take that idea of a, of a spiritual guide that sends visions and things. I also, players seem to really like prophetic visions and dreams it, it seems it's a common trope of fantasy i like using it a lot first off love the dream spell and i like using dreams as a as a fun way to introduce something bizarre and interesting and maybe give some information the fact that it's built in i see as an asset but getting that satisfactory vagueness prophecy and the like can be a challenge i would never thought about just reading the horoscopes and using and just like getting fodder for that from there because that sounds like a good way to just develop that language because i tried to do that a lot with with the character it wasn't an asimar but it was the same concept in uh -huh. the first starward bound uh in in our game oh yeah yeah with rape divines because he kept having these prophetic yes. visions cosmic druid kept having these visions of like a burning ring Blah, yeah. blah, blah, and like y'all go to Nero's gates, which yeah, yeah. I was playing on real world knowledge of Nero. Yeah. But still, eventually all I had to do was make sure some part of that caught on fire. Yeah, like yeah. there was a fight and oh, and you look up and there's a ring of fire. Like you just keep very vague imagery and just be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're the yeah. DM, right? right? So right. just keep that vague image in your head and yeah. then think of later on, like this is a good place to put that in. If that's what you want. If you want them to see these prophecies becoming real, just right. pick one or two elements from the dream that you give them 
and just make sure you can fit that in later as long as they see it because they're looking for it. Right, right, right. Well, they're, that's the other they're literally thing, looking that, for these things. Is that this is a moment where technique of like, I'm going to listen to what my players are saying, you take bits and pieces of it and mm -hmm. incorporate it with what I'm doing because mm -hmm. it's a good idea. You know, in the context of like this prophecy, that's how you can become a self-fulfilling event. A lot of ways like DMing anything is it's fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy until you think about it and we play and then it comes into sharp focus. Yeah. Similar with a prophecy, right? Like mm -hmm. vague, vague, vague. Oh my God, this is it. There it is. And then it's the moment of action. So I now that we sort of talk about it, I feel better. I like this element of Asimar, mm -hmm. right? This angelic guide. I think it, there's a lot of fodder for the yep. fun stuff there. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. Want to see us play? We've got games every week on Twitch, which we upload to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. If you like the video, hit that subscribe button, click the bell, give us a thumbs up, and tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching. Yep, if we could all just have an angelic guide of our own. Yes, Travis's guide is an angel of sleep and slumber. Hey, Trav, what's up, man? Uh, hey, buddy. I wasn't, I wasn't standing up to come record you sleeping on the couch. That was, a, that was, that was. A, did I interrupt the uh, bird? No, we were just finishing. We just finished. We were just finishing, and we just hear the light sounds of of Trav on the couch. <laughs>